Watts had a gay lover. That is just one of the breaking details we're now learning about the convicted killer of Shanann Watts and the couple's two daughters. Well, County District Attorney just released nearly 2,000 pages of documents in the case. Jackie Cray is in the studio. Um, Chris, it sounds like, was in multiple relationships while married to his wife, including one with a man. Shannon, from what we've found so far, Chris Watts was having a relationship with a man. We just said that. And they revealed police did an interview with this man's mother. Now, she says her son admitted to seeing Chris long before, quote, these horrible crimes occurred. She also said Chris paid him more than $300 on three separate occasions, and it was for lip injections. There are so many details right now. We're just combing through these pages to give you an idea. This is only part of the 2,000 page document. We're going to have updates and we'll get you through all 2,000 pages uh, as soon as my colleagues get through it. Uh, reporting in the studio, Jackie Crea, Denver 7. All right, Jackie. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most credible voice in true crime. This is episode 19 in Christopher Watts' What Else Do We Know? In this episode, we're going through points 50 to 70 in the chronological timeline. And at the end of point 70, we will then have concluded the November section of the timeline in terms of 2018, a, a very critical month. We start at point 50, which deals with the release of the 2,000 plus pages in the Chris Watts murder case, including texts with his wife. That was actually the headline of CB, from CBS Local at the time, um, just, sh just emphasizing the fact that there were also texts between Watts and his wife in, in part of that, um, that dump of information. Uh, before we go any further, uh, on Patreon later today, I'll be putting up some analysis on the latest episode, the latest podcast in the Killing of John Bonet series. There is also ongoing audio book uh, uploads in terms of the uh, book on Scott Peterson, Blood and Seawater. We're already at Chapter 6 of that book. That's on the $10 tier on Patreon. And then, of course, I did my first live with a couple of glitches on Sunday at 10 Eastern Standard Time, uh, basically yesterday morning. And um, I think it, despite the hiccups, I think it went well. And a lot of people were quite happy with that. So um, it looks like we might be doing the same thing every Sunday at the same time on Patreon. I have fortunately been able to get a little bit of a crash course from one of the sons of the, the folks that are regularly reading and listening to this channel. And uh, in super quick time, I was able to just tie a couple of things together. I had the software downloaded. I just wasn't 100% sure how it fitted together. And it should be a lot more seamless the next time. So um, I look forward to that. For those who are interested in coverage of the Chris Watts case, please subscribe to the channel. It's important that you do like, share, share with your social media. Let people know about the channel. Leave a comment and let's get started. So point number 50 deals with the article in CBS Local, sort of the first article dealing with the release of the 2,000 page, around about 2,000 pages of discovery. Now, as you can imagine, the purpose of the this chronological um, review isn't to sort of go through everything from the beginning to the end. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to review what was coming up in the timeline at a particular time. And so it's quite interesting now when we deal with the discovery to, to look at what did the media highlight first? What sort of came up out of the discovery first? And then also, where did the media sort of lose interest? What were they talking about in the discovery when they sort of moved on to some other high profile case? And 
it kind of felt like the media were going to be dealing with this for a long time. But then Christmas came and after Christmas, it, the case sort of disappeared. It kind of went cold after Christmas. So if we start with the kind of coverage from CBS, I've just sort of highlighted a couple of things that stood out to me at the time. And of course, the first thing was what Kessinger had said to the law enforcement. You know, that was something that we totally didn't know virtually anything about. The only thing we knew by now, by this, this stage of the timeline, was that Kessinger was now officially identified. We knew about the scoop that she gave to the Denver Post, but beyond that, there wasn't really any detail. And, and so all that detail was sort of waiting for us in a discovery. Her, inter her many, many interviews with law enforcement, I think there was something like a total of around about seven separate conversations. Some one-on-one -on -one interviews, others were phone conversations. And uh, I think in one case, she also um, provided a document to Detective Baumhober. That was one of the last things she did. So in those discussions, she had to give her version of events. And besides Shanann, the person who probably knew Chris Watts best in this um, surreptitious time, you know, when he was secretly conducting the affair was Nicole Kessinger. She kind of, if there was anyone who knew what was really going on with the other Chris Watts, the other face of Chris Watts, it was Nicole Kessinger. And so at last we were getting this insight from somebody. And the question was, well, how reliable was it? Some of it was less reliable than, than you know, than other information, but it was certainly providing us with thoughts and ideas and scenarios that we certainly hadn't even imagined before. And so what was quite interesting was she told police that she didn't think she was the only catalyst for the sequence of events, which one can kind of intuitively expect someone in that position to say, you know, it's not, this isn't all my fault. I'm not the only reason this happened. But I do agree with her. I think that um, her, you know, she admitted that being in Chris's life, Chris Watts's life, may have accelerated the process. It certainly did. But she felt that money was the biggest catalyst for the event happening. And I mean, that is a very interesting question. Is I think there were quite a few different things. You know, you've got to also look at the personalities of. Shanann Kessinger and Chris Watts, but besides that, if you had to make it a contest between money and the affair and say, okay, well, which one ultimately is the bigger factor? It's a very tough one to call. You know, would the murders have happened if money wasn't a factor? I don't think so. Would the murders have happened if there wasn't an affair? I don't think so. So it's a very, very 50-50 thing. I would tend to go slightly to the side of Kessinger saying that I think Kessinger was the bigger catalyst between money and the affair. You know, I think the, th the money was there quite for quite a long time. The affair wasn't there for that long and the, the affair was a trigger to get Watts to act in a quite an extreme way. Where, as, as I said, the money was had been a issue for quite a long time. So something else that Kessin just said, and this was quoted in the CBS report very early on. I mean, I think it came out, uh, if we just look at the date, it came out um, November 21st. So around about two days after the sentencing hearing and maybe a day after the release. It was, I don't know if you guys remember, it was quite difficult in the beginning for the public to get their hands on the discovery. There was a sort of a, it was made available, the service crashed, a handful of media houses seemed to get first dibs at it, um, and 
started reporting on it. But then there's kind of a delay as everyone was trying to get hold of the discovery and the Weld County had to kind of find another way to make it available. I don't know if you guys remember that. So even though all of this information was sort of being dumped on the public, there was this strange difficulty in getting access to it. So it's almost like everyone, everyone trying to get their hands in the cookie jar was causing the, the, the cookies to be jammed in the cookie jar. I apologize for, for, for describing it in such lighthearted terms, but you know what I'm getting at. Just this difficulty in getting the information. So something else that CBS highlighted was that Kessinger couldn't think of why what hurt his children. She couldn't understand that aspect in particular, but then she volunteered that maybe the kids saw him killing Shanann and so he chose to kill them as well. And this is kind of hinted at in the third confession a little bit, you know, that they woke up, um, except that in that he kind of says that he made a botched attempt to kill them prior anyway, which I don't believe, but um, I don't think that is a bad theory given what was known at the time. Um, I don't think it's true, but I, I think it was a, a fairly good guess for why anyone would do something like this. And uh, I, I don't think it was true in the end. Other things that were highlighted right in the beginning were Shanann's references to, to problems with her husband. And so a text on um, August 5th, 2018 was highlighted. This was obviously while they were still in North Carolina from 22.34, so quite late at night, where she was just saying, you know, I need you to tell me if you're not happy anymore, you know, if you don't love me, I need you to tell me. And then about half an hour later, Shanann asked, what, would you stay with me if we didn't have kids? And she was just trying to get a response from him. Obviously, she, you know, the kids were non-negotiable as far as she was concerned. But I think she was feeling there's, there's a difficulty now with him. What is the cause of the difficulty? Is it the children? Is it the pregnancy? Is it her? She wanted to know. She just wanted some kind of answer. Around about nine minutes later, so... So almost 40 minutes after her original text, what still hadn't answered her. This is on August um, 5th. And then Shanann was clearly frustrated, even angry. She said, I, don't, I just don't get it. You don't fall out of love in five weeks. But that is, seems to be exactly what happened. I don't think what was in love before that period so much, but I think the love that was there was sort of, kind of flushed down the drain because of the affair, because of what he was doing with, with Kessinger, because of his complete focus and eventually his addiction to her in that period. And a few minutes later, Shanann asked, how can you sleep? Our marriage is crumbling in front of us and you can sleep. And the crazy part of this is they are together in a house in North Carolina and she's texting him. Instead of going into the room, knocking on his door, waking him up and kind of confronting him, you know, you can look at it another way and just say, well, everyone's sleeping. You know, they're not in that house uh, alone. There's, I think Frankie's there, Frank and Sandy Rusek are there as well. So she's trying to communicate with him. She can't sleep. She's trying to communicate with him and trying to do it quietly. Then the article also references problems with in-laws. All of this is highlighting things that are true. But what is interesting is what they catch through this first run through and then what they miss. And this referred to page 2085, I think, of the discovery dealing with July 9th, 2018. And this was very true. This was a very significant um, event in the whole watch story. And what I've always found interesting is how people... Some people tend to dismiss it. Some people tend to say, oh, no, no, that wasn't a big deal. This thing that 
caught up the entire family. Chris's parents, her mother-in-law, Shanann herself and her own children. It's just fascinating how people would say, be dismissive of it and say, oh no, that had nothing to do with what happened. And then they almost prefer to say, well, I don't know why it happened. I think Chris Watts is a narcissist and a psychopath. In other words, I don't want to find any possible reason in who these people were and what they said and what upset them and what was going on. I, I would rather just gravitate to a label and, and that's good enough for me. Well, that's not how true crime works. And so this refers to, this is again in the article referring to a text at quarter past eight in the evening on July 9th. So July 9th was Nutgate. And uh, Shanana discussed how Watts' mother gave Celeste ice cream with nuts. Shanann felt this was done in defiance of her warnings of Celeste's food allergy. And Shanann then kind of instructed Watts the following. You should call your dad and tell him you did not appreciate your mom putting your daughter at risk today, nor do you like that she teased our girls. You should also say you don't appreciate her saying they have to learn they can't always get what they want, referring to the ice cream. They are two and four. And then Shanann went on to discuss marital problems. So what Shanann's kind of doing is she's saying, you must call your father and have your father reprimand your mother kind of on my behalf and kind of on our daughter's behalf, on Cece's behalf kind of thing. And um, I'm not sure whether that happened. I think, I think Watts did actually call his father. Whether Ronnie did anything is unclear. But we do know that, that they were fully aware that Shanann was unhappy. And I think everybody was fully aware that Shanann was quite unhappy about it. So on July 24th, two weeks after Nutgate, Shanann discusses marital problems. So you have Nutgate happening, and then two weeks later, Shanann is sort of aware that there's a problem, but she's not quite sure why. So at two minutes past six, Shanann told what you know, I realized in this trip what is missing. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, she's just really talking about how hard it was texting love you and miss you and him not being communicative and all that. You know, we've been through this before. You guys can go and look at it if you like. Uh, I'll put a link in the description. Then um, this was very interesting um, at the time. And I guess it still is an interesting, um, you know, two years later almost. In a phone search conducted by, by authorities, investigators found searches on Kessinger's phone for sexual videos and positions, hours worth of searches for Shanann Watts, searches including can cops trace text messages after the murders, searches for Amber Frey, if people hate Amber Frey and Frey's subsequent book deal. And of course, the social media had a field day with this. Um, I think this basically sealed Nicole Kessinger's fate in a way. When they saw this, they I think Nicole Kessinger's uh, reputation was sort of sealed and soiled, kind of at this point. You know, if you know what I'm saying, it it was sort of over. They, they saw Kessinger as opportunistic. Bear in mind, all of this happened after Chris Watts was arrested and, and everything had, had sort of happened. So she wasn't searching for Amber Frey while she was having the affair and before Shanann was murdered. And we, we don't really think of it that way because we're looking at it retrospectively. And, you know, but it, it did seem very mercenary and very kind of materialistic and very opportunistic. And people really weren't very happy with that. And then there was a reference to music lyrics. And funny enough, the music lyric stuff wasn't news to me. When I was writing long before the discovery came out, I was trying to figure out who Chris Watts was and the fact that he had this huge Metallica tattoo on his back and that we knew from Shanann's Facebook that he'd attended a 
Metallica concert that you know so so we knew that he had that interest and so I went and researched Metallica songs and figured out what the attraction was to Chris Watts and so all of that I knew way in advance of the when the discovery came out so when the discovery did come out and there was this highlighting of Metallica it was quite a nice validation for my efforts and, and sort of intuitions in terms of that respect. I had no idea Metallica would like come up in the actual timeline hours before the hours after the body bodies had been um, buried like on that same day. I mean that is to what extent the words and the music were, were in what's his mind and I guess even in Kessinger. So that was quite interesting. So, yeah, I'm not going to go through um, too much of the rest of CBS's article. You can go and look at that. Um, there's talk about where Chris said he was considering sh separating from Shanann. Shanann asked Chris to see a, a therapist, but he refused. Uh, well, bear in mind that he refused, and then later on he said he would, but obviously that was just playing for time. But it, it is, is interesting that... Shanann was 100% against the separation. So she was constantly, no, I'm not going to get a separation. Now, if you go back to that original question we asked at the beginning, was it because of money or was it because of the affair, right? Now, you, you take that same question and you lay it on Shanann's table in the sense of you say, why did this happen from Shanann's perspective? Was it because of money or because of the affair? And you can imagine if there was more money, Shanann probably would have been more open to the idea of a, of a divorce. I mean, if you remember what she said, her response to Chris Watts communicating to her that he doesn't want the third child, this was all happened on August 9th, which we subsequently found out. We didn't really know this clearly right in the beginning. It took a while to sift through the discovery and make sense of it and to prioritize what is important. In any event, Shanann kind of said her response to Chris Watts finally communicating with her that he didn't want the baby and he wanted a di divorce was that she, you know, she said, I can't afford three kids in Colorado. I can't afford to bring up three kids alone in Colorado. In other words, money. Money is the reason that I can't afford to get divorced. So if you bring the money thing back into it, then that shows you that that was a very significant factor, why the crime happened, and instead of there being a divorce. But the other aspect is, I, I'm not sure if there would have been the issue of leaving one another and not wanting the baby if the money wasn't a factor to begin with, but also if there wasn't an affair. I mean, if there wasn't an affair, maybe the baby would have brought them closer to one another. That's another open question to say, was the baby causing more financial distress or were they pretty much immune to financial distress in the sense that the financial distress was almost like a phantom to them? It was like hypothetical. One certainly kind of has that idea that they were living in a world where the rules of debt and owing money and, and having, having to account for your accounts, for your bills, didn't really apply. And I think that applies to a lot of people. You have bills, you take another credit card and, and all, your, all your debts are kind of theoretical. All your income, all your money is hypothetical. It's all on credit. It's all, all um, almost academic, except eventually it turns out that it's not. Your physical assets can eventually be lost. And if you're not careful, your physical self can be lost in that whole maelstrom. So the finance is definitely important. And uh, CBS refers here to an early police report details the couple's ongoing financial issues. Do you remember Detective Baumhover? He, very early on, he sort of stepped inside the house and kind of said, you know what, it looks like th this is a, a couple living beyond their means. 
And he was very astute in that regard. We also got very early on kind of a sense that Chris Watts himself was either irresponsible or not very hands-on or just not, um, in not, not in charge, but he wasn't maintaining or managing or dealing with his own finances in a in a very hands-on way and we kind of got that sense where, where he he said that he couldn't log in to check the bank accounts because quote she does the finances just kind of blaming his wife that that they were in that situation I mean in the sense that I can't check the bank accounts because it's got nothing to do with me but personally I'm not sure if I I believe that personally I think he was saying that to to suggest that he had no knowledge of the state of their finances because the finances were in such a bad state. So, you know, if we could rewind everything and, and get into Coda's head and talk to Chris Watts right in the beginning, in those first few minutes when they were in the cubicle, certainly if it was me, I think my first two questions would have been, what are your finances like and, and is it bothering you? Has it bothered your wife? Is it, a, is it serious? What have you been trying to do about it? Irrespective and regardless of selling the house, just let's talk about that in general terms. How much are you earning? How much is she earning? What does it feel like? A kind of a conversational um, thing along those lines. That never really happened. So that was the one thing. The other one is... Um, are you having an affair and then deal with those two that's what what we would know in hindsight to do on the other hand if you had to do that Chris Watts would probably have shut down the interview very quickly like so were you guys in serious financial debt uh, yeah not not really were you or were you not in debt da 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 and then he would have felt backed in a corner he may have felt embarrassed he may have felt like he didn't want, really want to admit um, something that is humiliating, you know, that you don't have money. And then he may have shut down the interview and said, you know, I want a lawyer. I don't like you. I don't like how you're talking to me. I don't not like how I appear in this. I'm just saying, so if we took what we knew in hindsight and hit Chris Watts with this, knowing the answer, in a kind of interrogation, um, you, you wouldn't really have gotten much out of him, I don't think. So the way to approach him would have been almost the opposite way that Shanann often spoke to him, which is in a, instead of being, um, <clears throat> how can I put it, instead of sort of controlling him and being quite aggressive, being gentle with him, and giving him a lot of time to talk and giving him the benefit of the doubt or, or letting him think you're giving him the benefit of the doubt and making him comfortable. And that was the right way of going about it, right? Chris Watts said at the time that he didn't know the password or he knew the password to the bank accounts but not the username. That doesn't really make sense to me and it doesn't ring true to me. And then Chris also advised if there was a stockpile of cash in the house, he wouldn't have known about it. It's kind of a funny thing to say. Um, I think there's something to that. I think the stockpile of cash is kind of the bins in the basement, you know, all of that. It wasn't a stockpile of cash. It was kind of a stockpile mirroring their debt and their, their financial circumstances. You know, that was kind of what was weighing down a lot of things, all of that, what was stockpiled then. And, and I think the crime was partly committed so that he would have a stockpile of cash in the sense of if he disposed of the house, he would then have some something to take into his fairy tale. You know, he would have some endowment to take into his fairy tale. So I think he was thinking of a stockpile of cash. Um, we know he was Googling the price of an Audi um, around about 
the, the evening, I think, of August 9th. At the same time that he was talking about getting a divorce, he was, he was Googling Audi prices because he knew he would need another car. Um, Ronnie Watts told investigators that his son described Shanann as controlling, narcissistic, and possibly bipolar. That's quite interesting, is that Ronnie said that Chris Watts had said this. It's not something we've really heard him say directly to anyone, using the word narcissistic or anything else. Of course, he also described Kessinger's bipolar. Of course, all of these are labels. It's not really telling us that much about Shanann, but it is telling us a little bit that father and son are in, in agreement what they think about Shanann and how they feel about Shanann. I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm simply saying that this is what was said there. Um, he also said there had been no verbal or physical altercations between Chris and Shanann. So all of that comes from point 50. We spent almost half an hour just dealing with one news report from CBS Local dealing with this de uh, release from the district attorney. So you can go and read that article. It's very interesting to read. Look at what the media highlighted when they were sort of when they first received this huge dump. And and what did they highlight? They highlighted the the enmity between the two families. They highlight, highlighted Nutgate. They highlighted financial distress. They highlighted an affair. All the main suspects. All the main sort of aspects in terms of the dynamics, right? Number 51, Shanann's mother suspected Chris Watts of foul play immediately after she disappeared. So that's something that Crime Online gravitated to. They, they kind of noticed that um, Sandy immediately suspected Chris Watts had, um, you know, uh, disposed of the children in, in oil. In fact, she said something like, she felt that Watts was going to pour oil on the bodies to dispose of them somewhere. And uh, she was right. The only thing I've kind of got that's a counter to that is if Sandy was so sure around the beginning, I don't think she was so sure immediately. I think she was, she was more sure later on. But w what I'm trying to get at is if she was so sure in the beginning, then I think... Chris Watts wouldn't have been sort of released on Monday night and let's let's all wait for Shanann to come home. Do you get what I'm saying? If Sandy was convinced that, that foul play had happened on Monday, then then I think something else would have happened. I think you might have had cadaver dogs on Monday even, or you might have had um, Chris Watts interrogated on Monday night rather for the first time rather than on Tuesday night. Do, do you follow where I'm going? So that brings us to the interrogation. That's point 52. Chris Watts confessed after approximately six hours of interrogation and when he did he confessed to his father. So that was quite huge that, that we didn't know at the time. This is strictly speaking not completely true. Um, Chris Watts actually had a interview or interrogation the day before Tuesday and I think that lasted about four hours so just four hours and then the next day he went in the Wednesday and because Kessinger had already spoken to the feds they knew he was lying and so he was really grilled on uh, Wednesday and there was the, the lie detector test and it was shortly after the polygraph which he failed dismally like he really got a poor score so shortly after that, that he admitted to the affair, and then sometime after that, he admitted to killing Shanann. He didn't confess to everything. He just confessed to killing Shanann, and he admitted that the children were dead as well. And that was what he confessed to his father. But it wasn't actually after six hours of interrogation. It was actually probably closer to ten over two days, plus the kind of grilling he got on Monday in the house um, by lots of different people. Lots of people were asking him things 
at the, kind of at the same time. Family, Nicole, Nicole Atkinson, Nicole Kessinger at night was wanting to know what was going on, and so on and so on and so on. And so he was, I think, pretty exhausted trying to keep his story straight. By the, and by the time he confessed to his father, his father was kind of the only friendly face. And, and uh, I think he just wanted it all to end. You know, for a guy who had no game, he just wanted the game to be over. The amazing thing is he never seemed to think of just reverting to type and just sort of crawling into his shell and say, you know, I, I don't know what happened. I'm not going to say anything. I don't have anything to say. You know, Shanann left. I don't know what happened. That's it. But he was kind of in the space where he wanted to talk. He wanted to to show himself, and, and I think that is because of Kessinger. Nicole Kessinger had led him to become someone who was like coming out of himself, and that's who he thought he was, and that's who he thought he was becoming. And I think that's who he thought he wanted to become, but it wasn't him, and he didn't know how to do it. But I think it's because of that that he made such a mess of his um, confession and plea deal and, and all the rest. I mean, it is extraordinary how Watts capitulated compared to almost all the other high-profile criminals we know who um, didn't throw in the towel on their own stories, their own crimes, you know. Even if you take Amanda Knox, who, whether you believe it or not, confessed when she was in Italy and then recanted on the confession and said, you know what, I don't know what I was thinking, and so now the confession doesn't hold anymore. And then she fought for, you know, through several hearings in Italy, ultimately winning. You know, there was a conviction, an acquittal, um, another conviction, and then the final acquittal. And that was someone who, th there was a confession somewhere along the lines in that story. I'm just saying that's the difference between someone throwing the towel on their own story, Chris Watts, like really early on, and then Amanda Knox, um, you know, in her situation, irrespective of whether you say, that, well, the one's guilty and the other one's innocent, I'm just saying um, Chris Watts threw in the towel really early on and then didn't even want to go to court. Number 53, Frank Rusick FaceTimed with Chris Watts on Sunday evening. The time is not noted. So that was something that really stood out to me is we found out that the children... Well, the children had to have been alive by this time. So it was early evening. It was probably somewhere between 5 and 7 in the evening. Frank said that he saw Bella. I think he saw Bella and he heard Cece. Number 54, Chris Watts overheard a conversation between Troy McCoy and Cody Roberts regarding a gas leak at Survey 319 on Friday, August 10th just after dropping Shanann off at the airport. That does seem quite convenient. It does make one wonder, did Chris Watts have something to do with that leak? Did anyone else have something to do with the leak? But um, it was because of that leak that Survey 319 became, came onto Chris Watts' radar and kind of became available. We know that he sealed the deal for access to, to the site Sunday afternoon sort of Sunday evening, Sunday afternoon, late afternoon after the birthday party. So we know that that was when he was thinking of um, where, what he was going to do with the bodies. He, he was already clear that he was going to commit murder, and, and that was where he was going to put the bodies. And that is why I feel like shortly after that conversation, having made up his mind, that is when he killed his children. 55. Law enforcement measured CeCe's hips at 9.5 inches wide at their narrowest, and CeCe was the smaller of the two children. The opening of the thief hatch was 8 inches wide. So a lot of this was my own research at the time. You know, this I'm not quoting the media narrative here. These were things that I was highlighting as I was going through the, the, the discovery. I was obviously also trying to find things before the media did, just to provide a service to the Crime Rocket readers. Um, 
find things before other people did and also interpret them before other people did. And then I provided a couple of articles and links to them in, uh, in this chronology and, and this obviously links to blog posts I wrote. So 56, 57, 58 are all Crime Rocket um, posts. The, the first was Chris Watts moved Shanann's suitcase from the bottom of the stairs to inside the master bedroom. Bear in mind I'd already written three, actually four books at this stage. And my scenario was that that Shanann was killed immediately upon arriving home. And the discovery was now going to prove or disprove my version of events. So I was interested to see, for example, where were her things? Where was her suitcase? Obviously, if her suitcase was in the bedroom, that was going to suggest, not necessarily prove, but suggest that Shanann had gone upstairs and, you know, whatever. If her suitcase was unpacked, if her toothpaste was on the counter, that was kind of going to prove that she, you know, arrived home and whatever, you know, uh, prepared for bed. The fact that the suitcase was at the bottom of the stairs, to me, kind of vindicated what I'd said all along, which was, I think Shanann was the kind of person who would have taken her suitcase upstairs, the kind of person who would have showered when she got home, the kind of person who would have washed her face and, um, and, and, uh, and changed. She wouldn't. She wouldn't have just removed her shirt and taken off her jeans. I think she would have changed. You know her, her underwear from what she was wearing uh, after the flight. And um, also, I don't think Chris Watts would have been in bed. I think he would have. You know, if it was a normal night, he would have been sleeping in the basement. So it, it wouldn't have been that she arrived home and got into bed with him. So I felt quite vindicated in terms of that, in terms of the discovery. 57, something else that was very um, uppermost in my mind was what the DA had said about the blood alcohol. So I went to look at the toxicology immediately when I saw the discovery and I started investigating that pretty much immediately. What did it mean, the blood alcohol scores? And... Um, and so that particular thing referred to a just some early research I was doing in terms of the false positive. So although I'd found this information, I wasn't sure if it was true. And so I wanted to check it. And so I got hold of a friend of mine who's a forensic scientist. And then he checked the data. And it turned out it was a false positive. 58, one month before a third pregnancy, Shanann was considering divorce. That was quite a big thing that stood out to me um, and that I also posted on Crime Rocket. And then an article in the Daily Mail, Chris Watts' wife had been planning a romantic getaway to try to save her marriage before she was murdered. So they were, they were sort of still showing the um, almost, not the sim sim sympathy aspect, but they were sort of still talking about Shanann's um, how can I put it? Shanann was still kind of in love with her husband and, and didn't know really what he was doing, what what was really going on. And they were sort of, you know, playing up that sort of sympathy narrative, if, if that makes sense. And um, so the Daily Mail, and they were spelling her name Shannon, um, just how she'd written out an entire speech that she pl planned to deliver on Monday to what, that what, what she was going to say to Chris Watson, and it kind of went like this. Can you please tell me something, because just like you, I'm in my head. I try to fix things and make them better. I know that you need time. I want to give you what you're asking for and respect your space. I need some time. This place that I'm in, in my head, is not a good place. And that's that's how the, Ted, the, the, the text read, what, what she was going to say to Chris Watts. She was saying, it's not healthy for me or Nico. I need you to help me to help you. I need you to give me a little bit of what I need or, sorry, I need you to give just a little bit of what I did or didn't do. So I'm not going crazy in my head to figure it out. So Shanann, Shanann's gut instinct was, was right. She was right to be worried about him. She, something was going on. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the Daily Mail article. It's worth reading. Uh, I'll put a link up to that. It's 
from November the 24th and it is a very long article dealing with all the all the information the article also sort of goes through the events of the morning how he looked up lyrics to Metallica called the girls school and so on and that's where it sort of deals with the romantic getaway and then also people calling to know where Shanann was such as Nick Nikki Atkinson so that brings us to point number 60 you know I was gonna go between from point 50 to 70 but I think I'm going to uh, end here at point number 60 um, and we will do episode uh, we will have episode 20 dealing with the, the next 10 in November what is quite interesting is the HLN again wasn't very active at this time you didn't really have have them spearheading the information it was kind of other media that did that but they had an expert called Joseph Scott Morgan a certified death investigator that, that kind of simply echoed what was said in the discovery that Shanann was murdered in her bed and that Bella fought back which is also the contention of the prosecutor um, I always find it amazing when experts do that the experts come onto the show and they basically just say what everybody already knows as though their expertise suddenly canonizes it suddenly cast it into legend or something um, at the at that time this was early November or November the 19th 20th 21st um, the discovery hadn't changed my mind on on any of the major points in terms of the the books that I'd written up to that point I wouldn't say that my feelings have changed much since then either so in the year intervening the second confession the third confession I don't think I've changed my view um, that much since then I don't wave that as a flag to say wow to, to stubbornly stick to something is a sign of genius or anything um, there is an area where I think it, it is possible that there may be a change um, it is possible that that like Robert Durst as I mentioned in the live Durst did a really dumb thing you know he he, he dismembered his neighbor and then threw his neighbor's body parts into Galveston Bay and they immediately washed up again now if you didn't know that Durst did that you wouldn't imagine him doing that in a million in, in, in a million years you wouldn't imagine him firstly being dumb enough to dismember somebody or, or crazy enough but secondly being dumb enough to, to throw garbage bags filled with bodies in the sea and not expect them to wash up immediately and yet this university educated dude that's exactly what he did do so one might say the same with Chris Watts you know, surely he wouldn't be dumb enough in a premeditated murder to to take his child to a well site with her mother and her sister dead beside her and not expect there to be hysteria and, and difficulty he, he's got to concentrate on on messaging his co-workers and on keeping this appearance of it's just a regular dad work so taking his daughter to the well site wouldn't fit in with that at all but as I say one might say well you know Chris Watts wasn't necessarily the sharpest tool in the shed maybe he did something really dumb I mean the murders themselves weren't weren't smart either so so I, I'm saying there's a possibility that that's true but it just seems very unlikely given quite a lot of, of things and and you know one of the most important things is the behavior of the various people um, we know how Bella would behave you know when she was under in distress we know she's already distressed about her sister we know she was distressed about not seeing her mother so seeing her mother being back but but not conscious not moving that would have distressed her as well and are you saying Chris Watts wouldn't have minded that he would have just taken her along for the ride you know um, it's possible I just think it's unlikely but then you have experts like this 
HLN expert Joseph Scott Morgan saying that uh, whatever was said in the discovery then was likely true. I don't think Shanann was murdered in her bed. Because she had no defensive wounds, it kind of seemed like that was likely. But that was somebody who didn't know Shanann and uh, didn't know Chris Watts either. So I'm not going to take it any further. That's it for episode 19. Uh, I'll be back in about four episodes time for episode 20, which will deal with the next 10 points. And uh, yeah, go to Patreon for my analysis on the latest episode of John Bernay Ramsey and uh, the, the Patreon live I did, which dealt with 20 of your questions, um, was I think around about 80 minutes long, uh, but a lot of people enjoyed that. So that'll be a weekly thing on uh, on Patreon every Sunday. And um, what I'm going to continue coverage between these um, updates on the chronology are, is going to be coverage on the Robert Durst case, which is going to last months as far as, as things appear at the moment. So Robert Durst, and then also Vincent van Gogh, the last journey of Vincent van Gogh. This year is the 130th anniversary of his death. He died in late July 1890, 130 years ago. I went to France to follow that last journey, also the Netherlands, visited museums, did some of my own investigations. I've written a book about it as well. And um, there are some really interesting parallels. So for example, Robert Durst gives a scenario for an accidental death, how he accidentally killed Morris Black in a scuffle and it's animated and it doesn't make any sense when you look at it. And Vincent van Gogh Recently, his, his death has been described in the same way as a strange scuffle, which I don't believe either. I don't believe the Durst scenario is true. I don't believe the Van Gogh scuffle is true either. Accidents don't just happen. In any event, we'll get to that uh, later on. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the channel and I will see you guys next time.